before, is this working? Before we begin, if anybody would like to follow along with our live demonstration, you can install IPFS Kub Kubo for Go, just the command line program for IPFS. It's probably in your package manager. There's a website link to wgetit. And then uh, if you want to follow along to any of the websites I'm showcasing that are on the network, IPFS is natively supported in Brave and Opera, but extensions exist for both Chromium-based browsers and Firefox browsers. Yes? Is that also supported for Vivaldi? Um, I'm not sure. Is Vivaldi Chromium-based? Yeah, so it should be. Mm -hmm. There should be an extension available for it, but I'm not entirely sure. Yes? Is it supported for Safari? I don't think so, no. There might be something out there, but last I've checked, no. Apple's a little slow to adopt something, and then when they do, they act like they invented it. <laughs> All right, well, welcome everybody. Today we are be going to discuss how to create, how to self-host an uncensorable blog using some new exciting Web3 technologies. My name is Davis Edwards. Welcome to Linux Fest. So first, a little history lesson. The internet. We all know and love the internet, but the internet actually started out as just somebody's computer. The internet really still is just other people's computers, but this is the first web server. This was Tim Berners-Lee, Tim Berners-Lee's computer at CERN back in 1991. You can see it says something like, this machine is a server, do not power down. You know, if that computer turned off, the entire internet was gone. But computers are just other people's, or the internet is just other people's computers, right? And so when we're talking about the internet, what are we really doing? When we go onto the internet, when we request a file, we're using IP addresses. There's an IPv4 IP address at the top, IPv6 at the bottom. Only real difference is IPv6 has letters and it's longer. But those, importantly, are location-based addresses. Those physically point to, or they point to a physical location of a, somewhere in the world, there's a computer whose address is that number. And when you're going on the internet to request a file, you're really just going to that address, hoping that that file exists, that it's the correct file you're looking for, that it hasn't been tampered with. There's kind of a lot of trust that you have to put into uh, when you're using IP addresses. So what if you wanted to get a picture of this funny little penguin guy, right? Well, that's stored on a server somewhere. It could be stored on multiple servers, it might not be on any server, but you're going to find a link on the internet somewhere, on some website, and it's going to tell you, hey, a picture of Tux the Penguin is right here. Follow this link. That link is really pointing to an IP address, but you don't really know that that picture is what's at that link, right? You're putting a lot of trust into the system. So we can do a little bit better. We can come up with a better way to address content on the internet as opposed to location-based addresses, we can have a content-based address. Now, a content-based address would be something totally unique to the file that you're trying to locate. So this picture of Tux the Penguin produces this content address, this hash. But the question is, how do we get that address? How do you turn a picture of a penguin into a string of numbers? Or more generally, how do you turn a bunch of ones and zeros into this address that's supposedly useful to me, right? Well, that's where the interplanetary file system comes in. IPFS is a distributed file system. It uses hash addressing, and it's a distributed hash network. So the theory behind it, well, IPFS is a protocol. And behind the protocol is the Merkle DAG, the Directed Acyclic Graph. So if I'm taking a piece of content, which is really just a bunch of ones and zeros, I'm putting it into an algorithm that translates it into a hash. 
And importantly, all of the hashes that are produced using that algorithm are consistent. They're the same length. They all kind of look similar. And uh, if that piece of content changes even just a little bit, you know, if it's off by one bit, it changes the hash address completely, right? And so IPFS works by breaking up files into individual chunks of 256 kilobytes. And so that would actually be the data at the very bottom, those 256 gig chunks. And then are all of those addresses that have been hashed are grouped together, they're hashed again, and those are grouped together, hashed again, up the graph, until you're left with just one hash. So I could take something you know, as large as a 4K movie and uploading it or putting it onto the IPFS network, it breaks it up into a bunch of little chunks with their own addresses and works up the tree, and at the end you just get one address that links to the movie you want to watch. So what are some upsides to this system of of doing things. Well, the internet has a lot of problems right now. And I don't think that's a secret to anybody. One of the biggest problems is the centralization of the internet. You know, there was a, an incident a couple years ago where like the AWS servers on the East Coast went down and it was like half of the internet was inaccessible. You know, Facebook recently had a big outage and again, it was like a quarter of the internet, you know, a lot of old people on Facebook couldn't talk to each other anymore. Big crisis, right? And that's all because there's a single point of failure or a few points of failure in our current system of the internet. A better way, you know, a, a good evolution of the internet we talk about with Web 3.0 would be having a decentralized internet. So instead of just, you know, a few corporations running big mega servers like AWS or Amazon or Microsoft, those people really being in control of the internet and how we access and get on and send data to each other and, and use the internet. Instead of just a few of those existing, more of those exist. So a lot more, it's decentralized, right? But IPFS is unique in that it's a distributed file system. And that essentially means that everybody on the network is participating in the network, not just leeching off of the internet, not just consuming content, they are acting essentially as traffic stops for the content. They are helping to, they're, they're essentially acting as their own servers themselves, right? So content on this network, congestion is greatly reduced, right? Single points of failure, out of the question now. Somebody's computer goes down, you know, my computer breaks and fries, and people can still use other computers on the network to find the content that they're looking for. And importantly for this talk, it's difficult to censor whatever's on this network, right? So hopefully in the future, you know, it'll be a, uh, we won't be beholden to just a handful of companies like Twitter or Facebook dictating what we can say and do on the internet or, you know, there are instances like, thank you. There are instances where governments, you know, like China or Turkey have censored part of the, part of the web and, and this will be something that's hopefully a lot more difficult to do in the future. And IPFS offers a solution to that. So we're going to run just a little demonstration for right now. Um, actually, here's a link to, this is Wikipedia stored on IPFS. If anybody can see that, it's kind of Wikipedia. We can go and read about geography in Europe. It's pretty slow. But it does work. Uh, you'll notice that uh, up here in the address bar, there's no HTTP present anymore. It's just IPNS. This uh, protocol replaces HTTP. And that's another interesting thing about the potential of this. It's kind of an invisible back-end technology. If this takes over, it might just be that the end user, the average Joe, notices, oh, hey, it doesn't say HTTP in my browser anymore. Or, oh, hey, instead of .com or .org, it says .eth. That's kind of weird. But the experience would essentially be the same. It's already, IPFS is ready for deployment, ready to be dropped into our existing infrastructure. So how do you actually use IPFS? So I'm in the a command line right here, and I'm going to navigate to, yeah, I'm in my websites folder. So 
let's do a little test real quick with IPFS. I've got somewhere an example file .txt. Let's see what's inside that. This is an example file. Just a little bit of text. Can y'all see that okay? Should I make that a little bit bigger, people in the back? A little bit bigger. That's too big. I've got this example file, just a text file, just a simple file, and I will put it on the network. So I'm going to make sure I'm doing this correct. IPFS add example file, and you see here it's gone through this hashing algorithm. It's produced an address for this file, and it's on my network. It's on the network, but really it's only on my computer right now. My computer can become part of the network. Uh, we'll get to that in a second. Let's just verify that this was correct. So I can take this address, cat out the contents, and this is an example file. So beyond that, you know, if I navigate into my website directory, I can add an entire folder onto the network. This folder. And you see it's gone through every single file in this folder and added it to the network. And then all of those files, it's chunked together and hashed that. And now I have an address for the directory and all the subdirectories and all the files in those subdirectories going back to the Merkle DAG. This is essentially what's going on here under the hood. Well, that's all well and good, but how do I actually access what's on IPFS? Now, for that, we'll be running the IPFS daemon in the background. So now my computer is actually connected to the network. I'm acting as a relay, as a host for data that comes through that I access. There's a, I think there's a, like a two gigabyte cache by default in IPFS. So basically, if I'm on the internet, you know, browsing a website, going through social media, watching videos, whatever, everything that I download is stored on my machine, you know, up to a certain point. And I become a distributor of that content. So you can see how this acts as, you know, a, a big torrent swarm or something. That's, that's what's what it's most comparable to. Uh, as long as you have somebody out there seeding the content that you want, you know, you can download it, you can help to seed it, reduces congestion, no single point of failure. It's a distributed system, right? So next, yeah, we're going to go into our browser. I'm going to copy this address. This address is just the root directory of my website. And I can go up here, IPFS colon slash slash. And we have a very ugly website because my CSS is broken right now and I don't really know why. This is a great opportunity. I have a very beautiful website. I just want you all to know that, but it's broken right now, so I'm sorry. <laughs> but you can see up here, yep, IPFS, colon slash slash. It's using this protocol. And it works. I mean, it just works. It's a, a drop-in replacement already. I'm using Brave, which natively supports IPFS, so it's all very smooth. All right, but, okay, this is a great case, right? This is a, a great proof of concept. I can, I can have content-based addressing and, and kind of have a, a torrent swarm for the, ol the whole Internet, right? It's all generalized, but there's some problems with this system, right? Well, that's a, am I missing a slide? How embarrassing. No, we'll get there. I don't have a permanent address to my website, right? I mean, this is, this is a fine system if you want something like that picture of Tux or a movie. Static content, content that doesn't change over time. In contrast to that, you know, a website, you're constantly adding blog posts or tweaking the CSS or it's just changing. It's iterative. Every time you're messing with it, it'll change the hash address 
totally and completely. So what's the solution to that? I mean, are you just going to go and like email a new address to all of your friends and family and say like, hey, I updated my website. Come check it out. That's a terrible solution, obviously. You'll lose a lot of your friends doing that. Don't ask me how I know. <laughs> so how do you name something that's always changing? Well, that's where the interplanetary naming system comes in, IPNS. IPNS is a global namespace. It uses public key infrastructure. And importantly, it's a way to attach immutable names to mutable content, unchanging permanent names to content that iterates, that changes over time. Now, it accomplishes this by using uh, the key pairs that you have on your computer running your daemon or whatever, right? It's, it's identified with the device that you're using. So we'll do a little demo of that. Let's see. Yep. So I've got this hash address for my website now. I'm going to add it, or I'm going to create a name for it. I'm going to do IPFS name publish and then give it that address. And it might take a minute. But while it's doing that, we can talk about, yeah, it uses, it uses key pairs. You know, all of this is kind of cryptographically based. Um, there was actually a problem I ran into when I was first doing this a year ago. I lost the keys that I had on my computer because I, I like changed OSs and didn't back them up. And so I, I kind of locked myself out of my website for a little bit. But uh, we've got that back up and running. That was actually a lot faster than it was a year ago. These people have been working on this protocol. So now we have a new name, this long K string. I can copy that. And we can see if it's on the web. And there it is. Now I've got a permanent, a permanent name that's pointing to my website. And I can navigate through this. And you know, it's, it's the same thing, right? I can update this website. I can add new blog posts, change everything around with it. And it'll have the exact same name, which is great, right? But there's another problem. These names suck. Yeah, I mean, are you really going to uh, go up to someone and say, yeah, please visit my website. It's at IPNS colon slash slash K51QZI5. That's even worse than emailing all of your friends and family, telling them to go visit your website, right? So what's the solution to this? Well, I mean, what's the current solution to this in Web 2.0, right? We've had uh, DNS has existed for a long time. Remember going back to the IP addresses, Nobody types an IP address into their computer to visit a website, right? If you want to go to Google.com, you don't type in 192.0. blah, blah, blah. Nobody does that. You just type in Google.com. So is there an equivalent, uh, an equivalent system for the distributed web? And there is. It's called the Ethereum name service. A lot of you are probably familiar with, an, with Ethereum. It's a blockchain, one of the better ones out there. It's more than a cryptocurrency, though. Ethereum is essentially a smart contract blockchain, meaning that you know, more than just money, you can have digital contracts written interacting with cryptocurrency, and you can essentially write programs in the blockchain that are permanent, immutable. Um, nobody has complete and total ownership of the blockchain. It's, it's something that's shared, right? And so that's what we're going to be talking about, blockchain domains. Blockchain domains are one of the only good NFTs out there. <laughs> NFTs have gained a lot of notoriety over the last couple years. The average person thinks an NFT is just a picture of a monkey, but that's really not what's going on. <laughs> NFT is a non-fungible token, and that essentially means like in contrast to currency, theoretically. Uh, Non-fungible means that it's unique. You know, if I have one block on this chain, it's a unique block. It's not interchangeable with something else. Like if I have a brick of gold, right? A brick of gold is worth one brick of gold, and you can, you know, it's, it's interchangeable. I don't care 
which specific brick of gold I have. I just want a brick of gold, right? NFTs are the opposite. They're unique. So maybe I should jump ahead. Yeah, let's go to this demo now. This is the ENS domain system. Here we can look up, uh, hey, here's an available domain. Say we wanted the domain smcgown.eth. If I have a little bit of cryptocurrency available, like I do, I could reserve this name for, you know, I mean, let's just do like 100 years or something, right? It's on a blockchain. Nobody can stop me from doing that. Yeah, basically, <laughs> basically. It's more than just a domain name, though. There, there's a few other neat things about this. Now, with ENS, with the Ethereum name service system right now, it costs five US dollars to reserve a name every year. So, you know, last year I bought my domain name. I bought it for five years. I have it until 2027. That cost me $25 to do, theoretically. Uh, we'll get there. So if I wanted to reserve this for 10 years, it'll cost me $50 plus a little tiny network fee for you know, paying our miners who run the Ethereum network. We want to make sure that they're doing a good job, right? But uh, it's more than a domain name. You see here, this is my domain name, houseofedwards.eth. My regular domain name, by the way, is just houseofedwards.xyz. So this is ETH. What, what does this NFT, what does this Ethereum name have? Well, it's got my GitHub account, for one. That's different than DNS, right? Uh, it's got my email address. It's got a nice profile picture of this really cool looking eye I found somewhere. Um, it's got, you know, a description. Uh, it's got wallet addresses. Cryptocurrency wallet addresses. That's pretty interesting. So here's an just another obvious benefit. I'll make that a little bit bigger for you guys. Just another benefit of an Ethereum name or a blockchain domain generally. Inst if you want to, you know, receive a cryptocurrency payment or pay someone else, instead of saying, oh, could you send 5XMR to 8BA8GC5J? You wouldn't say that, right? I can just say, send it to houseofedwards.eth or smcgown.eth or what have you. And theoretically, your wallet will know uh, which cryptocurrency address is the correct one, and, and it'll just kind of make all that technology, all that complicated junk, all of these weird long hashes, just kind of disappears in the background. It makes it a little bit more simple, makes it something that the everyday person can use. And then, of course, at the end of this, for the purpose of this talk, the most important thing, my IPNS name is stored in here, my permanent immutable address to my distributed, uncensorable, self-hosted website is locked into this Ethereum domain. And what's so cool about this is that this is the blockchain, right? Nobody can tell me that I can't reserve this name for 100 years. Nobody has the authority to go in and, and take this name down and remove the addresses and censor it. Nobody in the world could do that, you know, unless you perform some sort of weird hypothetical 51% attack on the blockchain or something. Theoretically, it's all, you know, it's, it's proofed against that, right? So where were we over here? Right. ENS, more than a name, more than a domain. It it's essentially acts as a Web3 account. This is something a lot of people don't talk about when they're talking about Web3.0. You know, hopefully, five, ten years from now, when this takes over, accounts will be a thing of the past, right? I mean, everybody hates when you try and, you know, book a hotel room or, or get a reservation somewhere, and you're just trying to do something on the Internet, and you have to make an account, right? I have a Web3 account that I own, I control, I'm in charge of. Nobody can mess with it. It's my own thing. I set the records. And the final demo we just did. So what are some obstacles to adoption of IPFS? Well, 
Yeah, go ahead. You could think of it that way. Yeah, I could go in and add more records. You know, if I got, you know, what 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 do we really want accounts to do, right? We want to be able to interface, interact with other people on the internet. You know, someone can just look up my account name, houseofedwards.eth. They could send cryptocurrency payments to me. They could find, you know, they could find a picture of me, go to my website, email me, all from just one name, right? And that's what's so exciting about it. But what are some obstacles to adoption of IPFS? Well, it hasn't exactly been proven in the wild. It's a little bit more than a proof of concept, but as you saw with the Wikipedia demo, it was significantly slower than just a regular HTTP website, right? Maybe it wasn't that bad, but say, I mean, s you want to look up some obscure Swiss, Swiss mathematician's blog on the Internet, and it's just like, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a blog that's only hosted like on his computer and he's out in the, in the mountains, you know, not connected to the internet very well. Like, it might take some time to find that website, right? Because really, what's going on behind the scenes with IPFS, you're, like with the distributed hash system I mentioned, you're going around asking computers connected to the network, does anybody have this content? You're basically just sending out a message asking for the website you want to visit or the movie you want to watch or whatever. Another obstacle is browser support. Like I mentioned, Brave natively supports it. Opera natively supports IPFS and ENS. But those are about it. Extensions exist for other browsers, but you know, it's not going to become a mainstream technology until it's you know, a, an opt-out technology, if, until it's just by default on and can disappear into the background. Another obstacle at least for me and probably a lot of us in this room, is anonymity. Now, all of the content on the network, all of the communications between nodes, all of that is encrypted. But the metadata associated with each node is not encrypted. So a very clever person or program could go through and, and watch the whole network, watch metadata leaking, and be able to figure out you know, maybe your physical location or what kinds of content you're consuming. Now, the people developing IPFS have, have a fine approach to this. Maybe they, they, their idea is that we just want to develop a protocol. We want to make it very modular and simple, something that you can add on top of. They don't want to lock anybody down into like one paradigm of privacy or security. And I understand that, but I think for a Web3 protocol, something that's going to power the distributed internet, I really want it to be as secure as possible, right? I want that to be part of the foundational layer. And then, of course, with the Ethereum name service, there are some known blockchain problems, right? Blockchains are notoriously bad for privacy, basically by design, right? Because the blockchain is an immutable record that stretches back from the very beginning. Every transaction on the blockchain you can look at, you can trace. Monero is the one exception to this. Monero has figured out a way to have the blockchain visible and you know, unchangeable, difficult to attack, but also mask everybody's transactions, make, make their transactions private and, and secure. But Ethereum, that is sadly not the case. Um, and then, of course, the fact that a blockchain is just always expanding, right? Blockchains, if we expect this to become, you know, the standard for the future, the Ethereum name system, if that takes over and becomes widely used by people all around the world, I mean, the blockchain is just going to explode in size, right? You're going to have to ask your computer to navigate, you know, petabytes of information if it's looking on this blockchain. And then, of course, there are some energy issues, right? Ethereum recently went through a merge where they were switching over from a proof-of-work-based system of mining to proof-of-stake. And that's really helped out on the energy issues. But mining and keeping a blockchain network running, it takes a lot of energy. And the last thing would be high gas fees. Now, this is something that has been more or less fixed um, in the last year since they completed the merge. But... Theoretically, yeah, I, I bought my domain 
last year, a little bit over a year ago. And I, I reserved it for five years, and I updated the text records a couple times. You know, I didn't do a whole lot with it. So theoretically, it should have been like $25. Reserving it for five years, $5 a year, $25, and a little change for network fees. But because of Ethereum's insanely high gas fees, I ended up paying closer to $300 to fix all of this up. Now, fortunately, that's no longer the case. I updated the records earlier, and it was a little under $3. But, you know, needless to say, that's, a, that's something that, I mean, $3, that's a lot, I think. It's something that needs to be worked on. Monero's gas fees are, you know, just a few cents, I think, maybe even less than that. Like, there's, there's some work that could still be done. Who knows if ENS will be the one to take over? I think the Ethereum name system is the only blockchain name system that I'm aware of, but I would like to see a competitor come forward and, and kind of offer a solution to, to some of these known problems. But other than that can take some questions if we still have time. I'll do my best to answer them. Go ahead. Um, so how, what would it look like to get something like WordPress that uses a, something like a, like a proper stack, like a Twitter stack or something like that? What would it take to, to um, broadcast those? To broadcast? Like, like a WordPress site over, uh, over SPFS, for example. Well, I, yeah, I'm not Could sure. I've never... Repeat the question. Yeah. But he's asking... Uh, what would it take to you know, put a WordPress website up on this network? I've never worked with WordPress personally, um, but yeah, I like to keep things simple. As long as you have the data, as long as you have the folders and the files on your system, you know, following, following that tutorial is really all you need to do, just loading it up onto the network. Yep. Um, so uh, so I, I was uh, like, I've read that like um, mm -hmm. some malware has been distributed over IPFS, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I was just like wondering like how often that occurs and like what what the what developers are doing to like combat mm -hmm. it. Well, that's interesting. I, I haven't heard about malware being distributed on the network. That's something that theoretically shouldn't really be possible because, I mean, with content-based addressing, if you know what you're asking for, you're going to get exactly what you're asking for. It's a trustless system. You don't have to trust that the person's giving you the correct information, the correct data. And once you receive that data, I mean, it's as simple as hashing all of that data to make sure that it really is the, the link that you asked for. So, but I, I'm, on, on, I'm unaware of these uh, malware attacks. Good. Was the IPNS mm. a implemented in the client as well, or was it a centralized service? I didn't. I missed whether or not yeah. that was dependent upon a blockchain, or if that was, for example, since Brave is mm -hmm. a browser that implements the IPFS, does it also implement IPNS? Yeah, IPNS is just a part of IPFS. It's all part of the same protocol. And so this program that I have running, IPFS Cubo, the command line interface, it's all. It's all just there. The command, I believe, was just IPFS name add, and then you know whatever hash address you wanted. It's as simple as that. Yeah, it's an IPFS command. I don't know too much about this, but um, is there a possibility for like hash collisions and stuff like that to happen? Yes, that that's something that uh, you know if. If, like the name implies, this file system truly goes interplanetary, you know, if humanity has expanded beyond the Earth one day and we're living on Mars and, and in all these satellites and we have a population of a quadrillion people or something, we're probably going to need a new hash system, right? I mean, theoretically, the idea is that one file gives you one address, but obviously that address has less data, you know, is not as big as the file itself or you've just the file as an address. But if we get to the point where we have, you know, a quadrillion people all with, you know, usernames and sending data and creating, you know, art and stuff and sharing it on the network, there might be hash collisions one day. But IPFS is prepared for that problem. It uses a multi-hash system. So actually all of these hashes right here, Q 
QM, you'll, you'll notice that all of these files, all of their addresses start with QM. And these two letters are basically just telling you what kind of hash this is, what kind of algorithm was used to hash this. So if we just swapped out for a different hashing algorithm, that's a perfectly fine drop-in replacement. We just change the prefix and you know, we'll have bigger and better hashes in the future. Hey, so um, you mentioned the key pair determines mm -hmm. the actual machine, which is the address ultimately. Um, what happens if a key pair gets compromised? How would that be mitigated? Yeah, if a, if a key pair is compromised, I don't know if there's a lot you can do. I mean, if, if somebody else gets your key pair, then they can publish content to I, the interplanetary name system, you know, under your name. They could impersonate you and, and pretend like, you know, if somebody got a hold of my key pair, they could change my website and make it look like I was the one, you know, saying things that I'm not saying. So I, I don't know that there's any solution against that. If your key pair gets leaked, you're kind of out of luck. Yeah, so I have a question about uh, the resiliency of data with an IPFS. Mm. So if you just have an image, it's probably unlikely, unlikely that all of the copies will vanish. But if something as big and complex as a web page, mm -hmm. any one of those components could at some point have enough nodes maybe die. Like how, how does mm -hmm. IPFS handle something like that for mm -hmm. something that's hosted long term? Yeah, that's, that's addressed. Mm -hmm. That's part of the distributed hash system. So there, there's essentially just a master hash table that's broken up into a ton of little smaller hash tables. And my node has part of that table. Somebody else's node has a different part. And so when you're asking for a piece of content on the network, you know, that request reaches my computer. I say, oh, do I have that data? No. Does anybody else that I'm connected to have that data? And then it can send that along to somebody else on the network. But then, um, trying to remember the rest of your question. Yeah, the resiliency of data, right? Part of this system is, is working out, you know, where to store data in a resilient way. Some of that does go on behind the scenes. There's a, I mean, it's kind of a two-sided question. You don't want everybody in the world storing that same exact picture of Tux the Penguin because, you know, then it's basically pointless. Why would I go on the network to, to reach it? But you also don't want nobody in the world storing it because you want content to be permanent. This is the permanent web that we're trying to create, right? You don't want that to disappear. And so part of the internal workings of IPFS is, you know, determining whose computer is storing what. There's, a, there's an interesting cryptocurrency project called Filecoin that has a lot of potential. I haven't seen too much news about it recently, but it's basically a way of incentivizing people to store like rare pieces of content on the web or something, you know. If the network realizes that that picture of Tux the Penguin is about to go extinct, you know, you can, you can send Filecoin to someone who's participating in the Filecoin network and, and pay them to host that image. So there are solutions that are being worked on, but that is, that is a big potential problem, right? I mean, that's a problem that already exists on the web as it is today. Websites go missing all the time, right? So you, you may have answered my question in that, but I was actually going to kind of answer that with a, the opposite editorial stance. I take it that once something is out there, there's no, if you accidentally commit like your private SSH mm -hmm. keys, you're basically screwed. There's nothing, or some private data. There's yeah. no way to be assured that it's not out there. Um, and I, I missed the first minutes of your talk, though. Mm -hmm. um, so is the expectation at the beginning that people are just hosting their own files, or other people, I mean, would need like Filecoin or something mm -hmm. to incentivize them to store it? Is that like the idea? Well, I mean, for the for my purposes, you know, the, I I could just run my desktop computer at home, storing my website and other files that I want to be accessed, so that I could ask, access them, or anybody else in the world could access them, right? Or if you're say like a particular fan of you know, like you really like a movie, you're just gonna pin that movie or somebody else's website. If it's something you visit all the time, it'll probably be in your cache anyway. But yeah, Filecoin and projects like that act as a way to incentivize storing so that we don't lose information. Yeah, but, but, but of, of course, course you can't lose 
right. sensitive information as well, right? Right. Okay. In that case, you know, I'm not sure. I mean, there's there's another side to that question. There's the whole debate, like, okay, we want a permanent internet, but do we really want a permanent internet? You know, do are there photos that we really want to be out there forever? Not to mention like illegal content or that sort of thing. And as far as I know, I mean, that's a problem that we really have yet to overcome. I don't know if there will be. I mean, free speech comes with a lot of downsides, really. But you know, this is kind of the way that technology is headed. I think I've heard of some proposed solutions, you know, based on like consensus in a blockchain, whether or not you're going to make this content available on the internet or not. But I'm, yeah, <laughs> I, I that seems like a pie in the sky sort of thing. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Who are, who are you going to get to agree? You leak your Bitcoin wallet, like you're not going to get people to agree like, oh, yeah, we should probably censor that for you. So, yeah, that, that's a challenge that might never be overcome. You just have to weigh the pros and cons of switching to this kind of network. Oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, were you handing to somebody else? Or? No, no. Oh, I thought. <laughs> Sorry. Um, quick question about the Ethereum name service. Mm -hmm. So you said that it cost cost it about f five U.S. dollars in Ethereum mm -hmm. to purchase that name. Where where are those coins going to? Is is this maintained by an organ uh, some organization, or is that? inherent in the algorithm. Yeah, this is just a part of the Ethereum blockchain. Ethereum is unique as far as blockchains go in that it's more than a, a currency, more than a cryptocurrency. It's a blockchain of smart contracts, right? And so I'm not sure if the coins are freed after five years and I get them back. I might be making that up, but I'm essentially paying the blockchain or you know, paying the people, the miners, to host the records and keep them accurate, keep the network going, right? So there's no central organization in charge of this. There's no like CEO of Ethereum who this money is going to, who would have the power to, you know, take down my text records and, and change what my name is pointing to. I think there was another question up here. Hi. So you mentioned that the um, the swarm is like kind of like a torrent. Mm -hmm. um, is there? What I know it has like um, IPFS has the Merkle tree. Yeah. Um, but how does the torrent uh, or how does IPFS swarm differ than like a, a magnet links torrent mm -hmm. swarm? Well, I mean it differs in, you know, I did I address the um, the losing data issue, right? I mean we've all maybe not all of us we've all tried to like download a torrent that isn't being seeded and you know just have that kind of waiting for days or weeks trying to to download the data so it's more resilient as far as a torrent goes other than that though i think the implementation is pretty similar i mean it's all about you know sending out a request who's who's hosting this information who's able to send it to me you know sorting out which blocks go where i mean it's it's good enough that i've you know i've even like watched movies on this network you know People who are hosting uh, a, a movie are, you know, it, it acts as a stream. And the more people who are watching that stream or watching that piece of content, you know, they are also seeding that content, helping to distribute it. So um, HTTP has stuff like chunking and, um, mm -hmm. you know, for streaming and resuming when uh, your connections drop. Um, mm -hmm. Does uh, does this protocol have anything like that? Um, I'm not sure. I, I think yeah, I might have read something about how, like, in a video stream, it'll it'll switch to oh, what's it called? Like the difference between UDP and some other what is it? TCP. TCP. Yeah, I think there might be a, a couple ways of of handling that, but yeah, I, I'm not really sure what what goes on underneath. All right, is that everything? Well, thank you all for coming. Welcome to Linux Fest. I hope you guys enjoy the weekend.